This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs the Playbook, and I have a superpreneur. That's right, a young, successful, good looking guy. You can see him right there, straight from the playbook closet. I have Rick Merza, he's the CEO of Dowlet, and he has an upcoming book. I love the name. It's the 10 things not to invest in. But before I get to that, Rick, welcome to the playbook. Thank you. Great to be here. Awesome, man. Well, you know, one of the things that uh, I was doing research is that all great men, I believe, are made, not born. And you have quite an interesting upbringing. So I thought maybe we'd start there and tell me the most influential things that have happened in that upbringing that has made you such a success. Sure, sure. Uh, so I, I'd like to say that we're still on the uh, journey to success. Um, you know, it's a never ending journey, in my opinion. Success, in my opinion, uh, can be a lot of things. and. Um, in these trying times right now, it's just learning, growing, evolving, uh, and adapting to everything. So a little bit about me. I was born in Pakistan, in Karachi, Pakistan. Uh, my parents moved to Baltimore, Maryland, um, in, in the East Coast back in 2000, uh, sorry, in, in 1994, I'm sorry. Uh, and we moved out of Baltimore, Maryland in 2002 to Southern California. Um, that brought me to California, where now I'm headquartered and live here with my family in the San Francisco Bay Area. But uh, a lot of the pivotal moments that happened in my life happened once I moved to Baltimore. Um, yeah, I had traveled a little bit as a very small, you know, a young child with the family, et cetera, but had never come to the States. So uh, first time landing at JFK and <clears throat> yeah, you know, the, the drive from there to, uh, to Baltimore and then uh, you know, all the experiences that came all at once, it was very, very overwhelming. But um, I learned a lot. Uh, the first thing I learned was how to make money. Um, because, uh, you know, in Pakistan, to learn. yeah, you don't have allowances. You know, a lot of my friends, I went to school and they, you know, this is for my allowance and I could do this because this money I was given, like, I'm not being given this money back at home, you know? So, um, <laughs> yeah, I started uh, very young, I, uh, cleaning cars for my dad. He had a small, um, side business he was doing to produce some side incomes, uh, flipping cars. Uh, back then he would listen on the penny saver and there was no Craigslist or auto trade yeah. or that stuff. So, uh, I my, was kids freak out. my kids freak out when I tell them I used to get my first nanny from the penny saver. They're like, what? <laughs> no, no, what is that? Something exactly. Crazy. Well, yeah. I have a question though. You know, here we are in compressed times of uncertainty, accelerated change. And, you know, you and I think the same, right? We're in the exact same position as when you landed at JFK. You yeah. were in compressed uncertainty and accelerated change. And you immediately went to, I want to make money. What do you think it was you know, a lot of people don't go there, right? They go to the opposite side. I always say a third of the people will be like, how do I make money? A third of the people will say, how do I just exist, sustain myself? Yeah. And then the other third will be like, oh shit. And they're a disaster. Yeah. You fell into the group that I'm in. When I see that's where the margins that millionaires are made in, when things are compressed and things are changing fast, I'm like, all right, how can I make some money? Yeah. Uh, because there's some opportunity. What do you think that is? You think that's inherent in the way you know, your genetics are or the way you were raised? What, what do you think gives you that mindset? Uh, I can't say for sure as far as, you know, if it's genetics or not, because there's so many people that catch on to this later on in life. Uh, it's a passion that they realize once they've tried other things, uh, if you will. But for most people, I think it's been since childhood. Uh, you know, it was so it would be upbringing, in my opinion. Um, you know, the way that my parents raised me, not per se teaching me these things, but showing me these things. So a lot of what I picked up was, and I'm sure you did and uh, other successful entrepreneurs in the world, picking up by seeing our parents do what they did or, or other people we looked up to. So from savings to investing to learning, uh, being a form of growing and success, uh, that was uh, embedded in, in my family household. And how did that evolve? So you, know, you had some side hustles like all young entrepreneurs. When did you get serious about making money? Uh, in high school. Uh, I moved to Southern California. Why'd you wait so long? <laughs> uh, well, until then, I thought I was making big bucks, you know, and then I moved to California and, and prices were what they were. And uh, we thought we were, uh, you know, paying astronomical rent in, in Baltimore. And then we moved to Orange County, of all places, uh, Westminster uh, in Little Saigon. And, um, you know, the rent there, I was like, this has got to be a huge five bedroom, 10,000 square foot house. And it was a you know, two bedroom, one and a half bath apartment at, at Brookhurst um, uh, in Westminster. So I learned then that, okay, the, the money I thought I was making a thousand bucks a week, maybe uh, as a, a freshman, it's not a lot of money. 
So, um, and in my household, it was, if you made money and you could contribute, you did. So I, as a very young man, paid my portion of the rent, paid my portion of all the you know, utilities, this, this, that, et cetera. So what I had little left over went all into me just buying a crap load of books and um, you know, every seminar I could go to, anybody I could meet that was coming into town. So I was left with very little money. Um, and I got very where, lucky. Where did that come from? It's so rare that, you know, an entrepreneurial high schooler, you know, is not putting his money into flipping cars or, you know, mirroring to make money. You actually went the longer play into self-development. I, I got that from my dad as well. Uh, him being a medical doctor, I the fondest memory that I had of him from when he would travel was be to these medical conferences. Uh, and, uh, you know, he would tell me what he learned there. I would be very inquisitive. You know, who did you meet there? What do they talk about? Why do they talk about that, et cetera? Uh, everything I'm sure, you know, a, a young uh, child will ask their parents, but he would tell me things that I later realized that, hey, it's more that what he learned rather than what those people were, you know, saying, because there's a hundred people that spoke, but he took away five or, key, five or six key things from that. Uh, and that really, really helped his practice, helped his development as a, as a medical doctor. So I had that discipline in knowing, um, you know, past just school and the, the books uh, that schools tell you to read, you have to do self-development. So I was a really early reader. It really helped me uh, reset my mind, uh, you know, not necessarily economic downturns, but, uh, you know, life. So um, I picked up a book and it was, you know, back to normal, thinking a whole new, fresh perspective. Were there any books that you read in high school that changed your life and that you still read today? Uh, I would still say, uh, back in high school, it was more self-development, a sense of discipline or whatnot. So I, I wouldn't say any one book stuck out. Um, uh, but Jim Rohn was somebody that I started to pick up on, uh, way back. Uh, I think it was towards the end of my, uh, freshman year. And, um, he is somebody that I still read today, still watch his, uh, listen to his audio, read his books every time I get the chance. And, um, he had a very profound impact as far as what direction I started to develop myself into. Uh, coming from Baltimore to Orange County, uh, I lived in West Baltimore, so uh, completely different uh, side of town, if you will, uh, a, a different side of the ro railroad tracks. I didn't speak the way that everyone around me spoke in Orange County. I didn't walk, talk, and act like the people that did there. So uh, he was somebody that put things into perspective where I said, hey, I want to speak like the 1%, not like the 99. So that became a very big staple of, I think, how I spoke to people uh, in my freshman year and got into a equity position in a very, very later successful uh, uh, retail franchise. So um, those little tweaks that I did were because of, I think, Jim Rohn's uh, teachings. That's awesome. And then, so you started in high school. When did you start your first real equity position by your senior year? Uh, no, I was already a equity partner sophomore year. I, it was oh, my wow. first job. I looked for, uh, I applied for a job, got a job at a place in uh, Westminster Mall at Disc Gear. Uh, they sold these disc things that you could put 10 discs into. They were indestructible. I sold, you know, the crap out of them. And come pay time uh, at the end of the month, the guy had closed up shop when I showed up for my paycheck. So I was very distraught. Uh, and this gentleman approaches me and says, hey, you know, let me help you. Uh, he did his best, called the, you know, whatever family member he knew that was an attorney. Long story short, said, hey, why don't you help me at a store I have for my cell phone kiosk in Whittier? I went to that store. Um, he told me, hey, whatever you make here, the way it works is no hourly this and that. You just get X amount of, of the gross earnings, though you did. So I thought, okay, if I sell 3000 I'm going to take home $600 for the day. That comes out to whatever the hourly, et cetera. And I did, I think, $4,800 the first day. Um, just by selling the cell phone accessories to just the mall employees. Cause the mall was a very dead mall. There's no traffic, but I said, there's over 300 employees within a quarter mile radius of where I am. So fast forward to about six to seven weeks in, I realized I'm building this guy's business. I'm, I'm refurbishing the, the kiosks. I'm putting in nicer stuff. I'm calling vendors, doing stuff that I learned from, from my self development is stuff that a business owner does. Uh, and when you are good at something, you should get paid for it. Uh, so that's when I told him, hey, you're going to open this new location in Lakewood Mall. I'd love to work there. But with this and that, you know, it's got to have something in it for me other than just a paycheck. So I offered to, you know, make, make me an equity partner. I don't need any money. I'll take what the business nets. It took nine months to become positive. But we went on a snowball effect. I think we from 2003 to 2006, we went over almost 90 locations throughout California. Um, he started with 11 when I joined him. So um, it was a blessing to be in that right place at the right time. Except, you know, it didn't begin too well getting the first job, but that job led to this job. 
and that job led to, you know, very, very, very profitable enterprise. Yeah. And I always say that, you know, there's no overnight successes, even young ones, they start early and they learn their lessons and they don't quit. And, you know, a lot of people just don't see it through from the first venture where, you know, you may not have turned out the way you thought, but then even the second venture, nine months into it, till you're even net positive, you made yeah. the investment in yourself. How did education fall? You know, big thing that's going to go on today is that education has been accelerated now into a new format. Uh, people are questioning, there already were before this happened, questioning the value of college uh, and the return on investment for that type of education. Now, I'm a firm believer in education. You and I both subscribe to, you know, personal development and learning every single day. Uh, but how did education, I mean, your dad was a doctor, here you were making a ton of money in high school. Uh, was there any aspirations of going to college or any need or, or any guilt? Uh, definitely some guilt, um, you know, both from what I had always envisioned growing up that I would, uh, you know, do my high school, I would do my four years college, this and that, and then whatever I wanted to do, I would have the option to do. I, in my culture and, and my upbringing, it was very, very ingrained that, hey, going to college and getting a degree is something you have to do. It, it uh, you know, it brings you class, it brings character and this and that. I got in high school and started to, you know, do well, et cetera, and learned that, hey, I'm learning more at my job and career and my business than I am at school. The only thing that I didn't learn, you know, the other way around was when I played football. And that, and that was learning sportsmanship, this, that, et cetera. But I decided that it was better for me to stay in my business at that time and later start to visit my options for college because it's always going to be there for me. Uh, whereas that business, I saw that, hey, this is kind of looking like what it looked like X amount of years ago, I want to stay in this industry long enough to ride out the wave uh, and, and see what the next innovation may be that I can be a party to. So for me, it became a, a guilt thing to where, you know, to this day, we talk to my dad, he'll come to the office or we'll have dinner and he'll say, you know, all, all that's nice, you know, but if had you just done a little stint at UCLA or something, it would have been a little better. So um, <laughs> yeah. you know, well, I'm glad you got that. But uh, you know what? I've been to UCLA. I teach there sometimes. Nice. You're much better off making the money. Um, <laughs> Real quickly, as you know, we venture to the book, you know, what other businesses have you ventured into as you move forward? Sure. So uh, the, the book will highlight a few of those businesses um, or, or those industries rather um, in which I'm telling them not to invest in those specific verticals. You know, like it's not like don't invest in real estate. No, definitely invest in real estate. Just don't go out and buy 10 single family homes and, you know, think you've hit the lotto or something. So, um, uh, one of the industries that we got into recently, it's very exciting for us has been quick service restaurants, uh, QSR, um, as we uh, call it here. And right now, the primary brand is Jack in the Box for us uh, in Oregon, about 17 franchise locations there with our operating partner. And that was for, for me personally, something that I followed going back almost 12, 13 years now. Um, I had followed a group that I befriended, owned a, you know, a whole bunch of Jack in the Box, Taco Bells and uh, other franchises here in the Bay Area and elsewhere. And they were immensely successful because they had this cash flow that just seemed like they didn't have to do anything and it was there. Uh, didn't work that way. Got deeper into it over the last uh, you know, 10, 13 years and found out it's not easy, but it is a good stable cash flow uh, asset that we want to be involved with. So over the last three years, we've worked with institutional investors, uh, investors both that we've worked with in the past on other projects, and, and we've gone in real heavy with this. So our goal for 2021 leading up to uh, the end of the fourth quarter is going to be to be at at least 62 locations from the 17 we're at now. You know, it's interesting. You wrote this book, like I said, 10 things not to invest in. What You know, looking at what's going on today, uh, and you haven't launched the book yet, but What's your feeling about businesses that have employees and overhead? Uh, as far as in, in the current crisis right now? Oh, no, just long term employees and overhead and investment. Oh, it's I mean, your, your payroll is the number one thing. It's the first notices that went out after COVID. Uh, it's the first notices we received from vendors say, hey, we need a little bit more time. Uh, and because we deal with uh, investors and investments abroad, we felt uh, the crunch coming a little bit sooner than that. So we were very lucky that our payroll was fairly reasonable dealing with a lot of outsourcing that we do. So we, we weathered their storm, but 
other businesses right now, I, one of the things I wrote in the book not to invest in is, is do invest in the restaurant industry, but don't go off and start a mom and pop shop franchise and your own branding and your own thing um, because you're going to try to rein, reinvent the wheel and it's just not worth the money. It's not worth the time. So we're seeing a lot of those businesses right now just here in town in the Bay Area closing up shops, just saying, hey, we won't be back. I'm sorry. You know, this took it out of us. It takes one bad quarter to really put a business out completely. Uh, their cash reserves are gone. Their savings are gone. Um, and when most of those businesses in a, in a fairly decent economy could have access to home equity in their property or in their business, et cetera, they can't do that now. Uh, that equity is not really there accessible. Banks aren't lining up and saying, we got this plethora of cash for you to borrow from. Uh, the banks are feeling the crunch too. So, right. Well, that, uh, that's what happened to me in 2008, right? People are like, how the heck you know, do you lose that much money? And it's mm -hmm. because I couldn't borrow against what I own. Yeah. Right? In my mind, when I was spending, you know, in lawsuits and other ego based stuff, I had $40 million that I could access anytime I wanted. I just yeah. walk into my private bank and you should have seen my face when I walked in and they said, uh, no, I'm like, well, I got equity. They're like, we don't care. We, yeah. we don't want to let anybody borrow, let alone you. Those properties aren't gonna be as worth as much in the next five years. And yeah. then you start missing a couple payments. Um, all right. Getting to the biggest lesson, right? That book, 10 Things Not to Invest In, you obviously have learned an accelerated amount of lessons through your career. You know you're humble enough to know you're just on the journey of success. You're enjoying Absolutely. You have the, the key component or ingredient of all successful people. That's you have a need since you moved here uh, to be what you must be, right? You must be what you can be. And I can see that from the first minute I talked to you. Give us your number one lesson uh, from your book that you think uh, you would love people to take away from is if you were Jim Rohn. Uh, I would say never stop growing. Um, that That one growth factor, I call it, uh, you know, choices that you have an option, a choice every day to learn something new and apply that knowledge uh, or not. Uh, so that for me has differentiated me between my competitors I've seen that have entered the industry, the same industry at the same time, same resources, but they've made the choice to say, this is a business plan and we're going to run it to the ground. Uh, they, they fail to see other competitors like myself come into the market come into the market with better resources sometimes with more updated knowledge and uh, more niche knowledge. Uh, that, that's really what's led us to be a really good value add partner to where we see value where others don't. So um, we look at maybe a hundred deals before we pick one. Uh, so that's also, you know, for us a choice, but we've only gotten to that choice uh, ability to make that choice by never stop growing. Uh, we, we're always learning. We're, we're the, we call ourselves students before we say anything else. So it's a constant learning process. You're awesome. Well, you live by the golden rule that I learned from one of my mentors is you're made by the people and the opportunities that you say no to. And yeah. so you even wrote a book about the 10 things not to invest in. Uh, learning how to say no is such a valuable uh, skill and mm -hmm. it does take an acquired knowledge as well. So I appreciate you helping people along with one of those skills and uh, I will say yes to you anytime, my friend. You are an amazing Thank entrepreneur. You. I love your story. Can't wait to read your book. Check it out. It is the 10 things not to invest in by Rick Mirza. Thanks for joining me here with Dave Meltzer on The Playbook.